Hi, and welcome back to Long-Term Care Planning, brought to you by AARP's ElderWatch. Today we'll be digging into part two of chapter one of this presentation series, which is options and acronyms. So we'll continue digging into some of the different long-term care options that are out there, as well as some of the jargon that you might encounter on your journey. My name is Jessica Zawadzki. Thanks for joining us again. ElderWatch Colorado is a 20 plus year partnership between AARP and the Colorado Attorney General's Office. We fight financial fraud and exploitation by providing educational presentations just like this one, as well as those within the community and around the state. And we also have a volunteer staffed fraud victim support helpline. If you or someone you know might be the victim of fraud or a scam, or uh, maybe you got a shady text message and said it was the bank and you, you don't think it's the bank, go ahead and give us a phone call and we'll help you figure it out. Our phone number is 800-222. 4444, select option two. Welcome back. So today we'll be continuing our conversation about options that you have when it comes to long-term care planning, as well as some of the acronyms, some of the jargon that you might encounter. Next time, we'll talk about some of the considerations you might want to keep in mind when evaluating a facility, when comparing one to the other, and when kind of deciding what level of care you're looking for in the first place. After that, we'll talk about how insurance comes into play, where it does and doesn't, might or might not help you out with that burden of cost. And then we'll finish the series by talking about strategies and other ideas for paying for things related to long-term care that insurance doesn't cover. So I mentioned before, but a big part of the reason that I am doing this presentation is inspired by one of our volunteers. So I had a volunteer ask me about how, where do you even begin with long-term care planning? Do you plan in advance? And I, I didn't really have enough information or rather as much information as I wanted. So I've been scouring, scouring resources, internet, individuals to make this presentation so that I could ultimately answer his questions, but hopefully answer your questions as well. And as I began digging and continue digging and learning and calling people, I became really passionate about this because it's really overwhelming, but it's really, really important to understand what's out there, especially given the current climate within these communities. So did you know that since 1990, at least in Colorado, the average cost of long-term care has increased by 6.2% per year for a total jump of 124%. And that 6.2% average increase is expected to more or less continue along those lines. At the same time, during the pandemic, many, many long-term care facilities shut down. We all remember those times and you know it was very complicated, very difficult. But the problem is that they haven't necessarily opened back up at the same rate as those closures. So we're in the supply and demand issue where the demand is greater than the supply, which is also why it's important to think about these things in advance because it might take a little bit longer than you expected to actually get into a facility when you need it if this closures and lack of reopenings kind of continues. And then lastly, I want to mention staff shortages, which are kind of everywhere. This news is, dare I say, ubiquitous, or this problem, we hear about it a lot. And so according to some, many long-term care facilities are operating with a 15% drop in capacity. So these three things together, the rising cost, the closures, and the lack of reopening, so greater supply than demand, or excuse me, greater demand than supply, as well as those staff shortages, really made me care about educating people about how to make these decisions in advance because it's, it's just getting trickier and trickier to do so. So thanks for being here and hopefully I'll help clear things up for you and give you some food for thought. All right, so if you are here for part one of options and acronyms, this is the same slide, but just in case you weren't here, I wanna bring you up to speed. So two acronyms that you'll hear me reference in various different options, but that you might also encounter in your journey are ADLs and IADLs. ADLs are the things you need to be able to do to survive and live within society. So think 
using the bathroom by yourself, being able to feed yourself. And then IADLs are the things that we need to accomplish those tasks. So this might be managing your finances. Is managing your finances, if you do a good job or a bad job, going to mean life or death? Not necessarily, but if you are making poor financial decisions and then you can't afford to eat, then that is a problem. Or being able to prepare your meals. Do you need to be able to use a pan to survive? Maybe not, but do you need to be able to cook a meat before you eat it to survive? Yes, you do. So that's the difference between ADLs and IADLs. Uh, I think of IADLs as kind of the vehicle to accomplish ADLs. You will also see that I have organized things via short-term and long-term, as well as low level of assistance and high level of assistance. And when I say short-term, I'm generally talking about a care placement that is designed for a couple of days to a couple of months, but really it's usually for a couple of days to a couple of weeks. And when I say long-term, I'm usually talking about a couple of months to the duration of someone's life. So keep that in mind because it will be a spectrum as we'll talk about later. Another spectrum that we'll be organizing things by is low level of assistance and high level of assistance. And when I say low level of assistance, really I'm talking about care that is for somebody who can meet the majority of their ADLs or who will be able to pretty soon. This is also for someone who doesn't need the most complex medical care. So for example, you might need meds management or wound care, but you don't need to be intubated. This is also generally care for someone who doesn't need to be constantly monitored for their safety. So that's what I mean by low level. And then on the other side, high level is for conditions that are generally chronic or either not expected to go away or they're expected to actually get worse. Uh, this category is also for individuals who need to be monitored more constantly for their own safety, as well as those who are more medically complex. And maybe goes without saying, but who need this higher level of care is for people who need more help with meeting their ADLs altogether. They, they might not be able to meet them by themselves, let alone those IADLs. All right, so let's continue now that we've covered the basics. All right, so here is my beautiful matrix that I made to help organize our different care options that we'll be talking about. And so last time we talked about that top half. So we talked about short and long-term options for those who need a lower level of assistance. And today we're going to be talking about short and long-term options for those who need a higher level of assistance. Let's get into it. So to kick things off, we'll start with the bottom left quadrant, which is a higher level of assistance over a shorter period of time. You may need a short-term higher level of assistance for some of the same reasons that you would need a short-term lower level of assistance. This is also an option for individuals with serious and terminal illness, but not exclusively terminal, especially those though with less than six months in their prognosis. This might also be for a serious and medically complex injury. And again, keep in mind that when I'm talking about level of assistance, one of the big things that I'm factoring in is those ADLs. So maybe if you're at a short-term lower level facility, you are able to meet more of your ADLs. And in a longer term facility, maybe you still will, you still are expected to make a recovery, but you need a little bit more help on that journey. In this quadrant, we'll talk about four different options an acute care hospital, an acute rehab hospital, which is also sometimes known as intensive inpatient rehab, hospice, and palliative care. An acute care hospital may be what we think of when we think of somebody going to the hospital for a serious injury or illness. This place is the spot in the journey used to diagnose and treat, but only in the short term. So the goal here is still to discharge the patient as soon as possible. 
this is not a place to heal, but rather a place to manage the urgent needs that you need to have met to stabilize before the next step in your recovery. This is kind of similar to an LTAC or a SNF, but it's way more medically intensive. So that is an acute care hospital. An acute rehab hospital or an intensive inpatient rehab is inpatient rehab with typically three hours a day of therapy, which might include anything or any combination of physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. The goal here is to discharge from the acute rehab hospital to a SNF, an LTAC, or to go home, and the average length of stay here is about a week or two. So this is like adding another step in between the hospital for an emergency and then the SNF or LTAC to get you back to your regular level of function before you go back home or to a lower level of care. And depending on the condition, some people might stay here for a few days to even a few weeks. But again, it's generally expected that you can do about three hours a day of therapy while you're there. And then the last two we have here, they're often used interchangeably. And though they're similar, they're not the same thing. So hospice is an option for individuals with a terminal diagnosis. And usually to enter hospice, you have to have a doctor's prognosis saying that you're expected to have six months or less to live. Now, that doesn't mean that you won't live for more than six months, but generally that's the entrance criteria for a hospice. And the other big difference between hospice and a lot of other things is that it doesn't provide curative care. So this is at the point where, for example, with cancer, you're not doing chemo or radiation anymore. Instead, hospice is focused on symptom management. You're not getting rid of the illness, but you're trying to be comfortable. Hospice also has an interdisciplinary team and sometimes they'll provide support for caregivers. Hospice can also be provided in your house or in a center. Palliative care is similar to hospice in that it's not providing curative care. It's designed for symptom management and it generally also has and it generally also has an interdisciplinary team. But unlike hospice, this can be provided at any stage of diagnosis, even if your diagnosis is not terminal and you can get palliative care in conjunction with curative treatment. Palliative care is designed to help with symptom management such as pain, but also with logistical, psychological, social, and caregiving challenges associated with a serious illness. And like hospice, palliative care can be provided at a center or at home. But unlike hospice, palliative care can be provided for weeks, months, or in some cases, even years. An acute care hospital, on average, is the shortest length of stay option that we've discussed. The average length of stay here is about five days. An acute rehab hospital is similar, kind of, to an acute care hospital, but a stay there is generally going to be a little bit longer, and it's more focused on rehabilitating you, as the name would suggest. Hospice care generally is for those who have a terminal illness with a prognosis of six months or less to live, but potentially you could be there for longer than six months. And palliative care, though similar to hospice and sometimes confused with hospice, flows along this continuum. So you'll see it's not just a circle. I made it a big oval, I guess. Uh, and this is because it can be used for short term. It can be used for long term. Similar to hospice, it is non-curative care, though it can be in conjunction with curative care. It's generally designed for sy symptom management. And we're burying it at home with quadrant number four. So quadrant number four is the highest level of assistance for the longest period of time. So the options that we're going to talk about in this fourth and final quadrant are for individuals who have complex chronic medical needs that really can't be taken care of sufficiently at home. This is also for individuals with memory care issues, particularly those who present a wandering risk that puts them in danger of harming themselves. This may also be for individuals who have reached a higher acuity than their caregivers are able to meet or 
that they can't meet anymore or for those who need constant supervision to make sure that they're safe. In this quadrant, we'll talk about four options as well. And let's talk about nursing homes first. These may also be referred to as long-term care or custodial care. And I do want to mention some people will also refer to this as a SNF in part because this is a facility that provides skilled nursing, but we're not going to be using those terms interchangeably for the purposes of our presentation. A nursing home is a place that provides extended care for a chronic condition that is not expected to go away and unfortunately is more likely to worsen. These facilities do provide help with ADLs such as bathing, eating, and dressing, and they generally provide a high level of supervision. So for example, in a nursing home, your loved one may be checked on every hour or two, whereas in an independent or assisted living facility, they may not be checked on at such a regular interval. In a nursing home, daily support with bathing, toileting, dressing, etc., is the norm, whereas in an assisted living facility, you or your loved one is much less likely to get support with all of these ADLs, and the support might be much more minimal. Memory care is generally housed within a nursing home, and sometimes it's also part of a CCRC, or a Continuing Care Retirement Community. This option is specifically for someone with moderate to severe dementia or Alzheimer's, and a big piece of its importance is that it's a secured location. So there's usually a higher level of supervision, and to enter or exit that wing or that facility, you usually need a key or a code. This secured option is to prevent wandering. We know that many individuals with Alzheimer's and dementia, they do present a wandering risk and sundowning may also make things a little bit more challenging for all of those involved. For those who are unaware, sundowning is increased agitation, aggression, or confusion that may occur for individuals with dementia or Alzheimer's later in the afternoon or early in the evening, coinciding with the sun setting. So having a secured environment helps to ensure that these individuals are safe at all times, but especially those when, you know, in another facility, there might be less monitoring. An assisted living facility is almost like an in-between between independent living and a nursing home. And personally, I kind of struggled with which quadrant to put it in because they kind of can vary a lot in terms of what they offer. In these facilities, people will get some help with their ADLs, but they're generally not recommended for individuals with complex needs or those who are at a wandering risk because the level of supervision and medical intervention is generally not as high or comprehensive as that is what is found in a nursing home or a memory care unit. It is important to note that an assisted living facility may have caregivers as opposed to medical professionals that might be found in, for example, a nursing home or a memory care unit. Make sure you check that out. And last on this list is boarding care or a personal care home. And this is most similar to an assisted living facility, but it's a very small environment, often literally in somebody's home that's been converted. Boarding care facilities have less than 10 individuals, while assisted living facilities might have dozens. Boarding care likely will also help with ADLs, but it may not have the same level of skilled medical care. In our next presentation, we'll get into kind of some of these considerations, but I just think it's worth pointing out these different levels of care and kind of what that means in terms of what you or your loved one might experience. Of our four options in this quadrant, an assisted living facility is generally the lowest level of care of our long-term higher level of care options. In fact, I actually struggled between whether I should put assisted living in this section or whether I should put it in the lower level long-term care, but I decided to put it here because there's usually some help with ADLs in an assisted living facility. That said, it's not always all of them. 
And I really want to emphasize on this subject that an assisted living facility is not the same as a nursing home. And putting someone who needs a higher level of care and higher level of support with those ADLs into assisted living instead of a nursing home, it can lead to a lot of issues, especially with people getting their needs met. A nursing home is a longer term option with some of the highest level of assistance of the four options that we've discussed in this quadrant. And it's generally for someone who can't meet all of their ADLs independently or needs help with multiple ADL, ADLs, needs supervision, and needs more intensive care. Memory care is generally understood to be the most intensive of the options that we've discussed in this section. And the biggest difference between memory care and a nursing home is the level of security due to wandering risk. There also tends to be a difference in the caregiver ratio, and we'll get into what caregiver ratio means next time. Lastly, we've also discussed boarding care facilities, which are kind of in between a nursing home and an assisted living facility in terms of the level of care. But the big difference here is that it's usually a smaller environment and it's often just in somebody's house that's been converted. Usually there's less than 10 residents there. Whew, we've covered a lot. If you've been here for both episodes of the options and acronyms portion of this web series, here's all the options that we've talked about. And you can see there are a lot of them. Taking some time to understand the differences that you might encounter can really help set you up for success because it's a very overwhelming process. So at least now we're on the same page linguistically before we get into thinking about these choices as well as our needs. So next time, we'll actually talk about some of the things that you might want to keep in your mind as you're looking at different long-term care options and facilities. Until then, though, my name is Jessica Zawanski. Thank you for joining me here at Elderwatch Colorado for our long-term care planning series. See you next time.